Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to our third event in our Broadening Horizons Heritage Cafe lecture series. Uh, we used to hold these events in person, but um, due to our success of virtual programming last year, we decided to keep them virtual. Uh, we have a number of lectures uh, slated for the coming months, so uh, please look at our Facebook and uh, pages to watch out for information on those. Tonight's lecture is presented by Stephanie Jolivet, a um, archaeologist at the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. She has a lot to share with us tonight about Washington State archaeology and the way that our cultural resources are being endangered by the effects of climate change and water level rise. This event is brought to you by the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office in conjunction with Historic Tacoma and the Tacoma Historical Society. I am Zoe Scuderi and I am the Historic Preservation Intern for the City of Tacoma. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function um, as we will be taking those questions and answering them at the end. Uh, but before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe. And I actually have a video that I'd like to share with you guys. But uh, before we begin, I'd like to also acknowledge that both Stephanie and I happen to be in Olympia um, today. So we are actually both um, on the Squaxin uh, tribe land that we just wanted to Make sure that was also acknowledged. It is the land right here that the Puyallup people have lived on since the beginning. This right here is where we are in the world, our homelands. We work on our ancestral lands. We raise our children who go to school on the land of the Poyalip people. We acknowledge that the Medicine Creek Treaty was signed for the whites to take our land for their benefit. Land was assigned to our people. The Caucasians said, this is your land, and they took that land from us too. Our land was stolen from us. Treaties were broken. But we are still here today. Our people forage for food and materials, we pick berries, we canoe, we practice our traditional ways, and we speak Tuolshutzi. Just as our ancestors did. We are finished. So we want to again um, acknowledge that we are working on um, the traditional homelands of the Puyallup tribe as well as the Squaxin tribe. Now, back to um, our presentation for tonight, I would like to introduce our speaker, um, Stephanie Jolivet. Stephanie is an archeologist at the Washington State Department of Archeology span and Historic Preservation. She received her education and training first at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin-Madison and then earned her graduate degree at the University of Washington in Seattle. She has conducted archeological research in Alaska, Hawaii, California, and Washington State. Her coldest field work um, is in the icy, uh, tell me if I pronounce this uh, incorrectly, but Kobetsu or Koze uh, Kozetsu. Kozetsu. Yeah, Kozetsu. Yeah, Kozetsu. Yeah. Kozetsu. <laughs> um, in Alaska in April. Um, and then her hottest field work was on the big island in Hawaii in the lava fields in August. Uh, during her years at the University of Washington, she worked with the public at the Burke Museum of Natural History and Culture and par participated in the San Juan Islands Archaeological Field Project. 
She has a special interest in archaeology of islands and shorelines, making this topic uh, the perfect fit for tonight. So Stephanie, we are very excited to hear um, what you have uh, for us in regard to Washington, uh, uh, Washington State archaeology, our cultural resources, along with climate change and uh, how shorelines are being affected by this. Thank you for the introduction. And yeah, there were a lot of, um, sorry, I gave a lot of big words in that, <laughs> all those titles of places. So thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm going to work on sharing my screen now so you guys can see the presentation. Today, as, as Zoe said, I'm going to talk about sea level rise and Washington archaeology. Um, um, I was excited to hear from um, the city of Tacoma that they were actually interested in hearing about this topic because it's something I have been thinking about a lot and just hadn't taken the time to put a talk together on this topic. Um, as Zoe said, my name is Stephanie Jolivet, and I'm uh, my position as a Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation is as the local government archaeologist. Um, and that means that I work a lot with local governments, like cities, counties, and local utility districts, people like that, um, who need help um, reviewing permits um, for cultural resources. And so that's the majority of what I do in my day to day here um, at the DAP, but we do lots of other things here. So today um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the DAP, the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and what we do. Then I'm going to talk about um, coastal archaeology in Washington, and then I'm going to bring it all together and we can then really talk about the impacts of sea level rise and other climate effects on those sites. All right, so we can get them to advance. Yep, that worked. Okay, so the Department of Archaeology, and I'm just going to say the DAP from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so we are one of um, the SHPO offices, which are the State Historic Preservation Offices um, that were established um, throughout the country um, by the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. So there's 50 of them for the 50 states. Um, and then each of those offices gets in individually established into law within their state. So here in Washington, we were established by the legislature under RCW 2734. So if you're ever looking for legal stuff associated with our office, it's under that 2734. And because of this, we're, we're both state and federally funded office. Um, the DAP mission, um, as outlined by the legislature, um, is that we are the primary agency with knowledge and expertise in archaeology, historic preservation, and the recovery of non-forensic human remains. Um, I'm not going to talk about human remains today, but we have a, a state physical anthropologist here in our office who deals with human remains that are found that aren't associated with law enforcement, but are um, older historic sets of remains. Um, and then we have three major program areas. Um, we have regulatory work, um, which is a lot of what we do in our day to day is regulatory work, but we also have some economic development programs, grants and such. And then a really important thing that's going to link to what we're talking about today is that um, historic and cultural data management. So we are the central repository for archaeological and um, all cultural resources data in the state. All right, so where all this data is stored um, is really interesting. We have a, a public information portal called Wizard. Um, which is the Washington Information System for Architectural and Archaeological Records Data, which is why we call it WIZARD. <laughs> also a very long one. Um, and there's parts of this database that are actually publicly available. Um, and so if you go to our website um, at dap.wa.gov and, and scroll down until you see this and, and click on that little button that says Start WIZARD, you can, you can look at some of this data. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that because it's a fun place to go and look and see um, information about your property or about your town. Okay, and so this is um, the part on our website where you, where you can get into Wizard if you push that button. Um, I did want to mention that archaeological site locations are not considered public records here in the state of Washington. Uh, we actually have an exemption from public disclosure, disclosure, so you won't be able to find the archaeological sites on the maps. Um, that are publicly available. And that's because unfortunately, 
people tend to use those maps um, to go dig up sites. Um, and so we've had to protect that data. So it's on a need to know basis. If you're a landowner, you can get that information about your property. Um, if you're doing a project, um, you know, the cities and counties can see that information that they need to make decisions. Um, and so that's another reason these talks are so important because you get to see some stuff that normally is not, not always available. So here's just a screenshot of what that, that map looks like at the DAP. And so you can see that we can actually map all of the resources that um, we're trying to manage here in the state of Washington onto this map. Um, and just on Monday, I took a quick look at some of the stats to see how much information is in there right now. And so all those stats on the left of the map are, are some of the numbers. We have more than 36,000 archeological sites right now that we know about in the state. Um, we have, you know, 2,900 register listed properties, um, 640,000 inventory properties. Those are individual forms that have been filled out for historic buildings or structures. Um, 35,000 survey reports and more than 3,000 historic cemeteries. So there's a lot of data that we are managing here at the DAP, but it makes it a really great database and a really good data source um, when we want to start looking out. Um, impacts on sites for climate change. We have all the data in the right place. Coastal archaeology in Washington. So why this focus on coastlines? Um, so coastlines um, here and on the west side of the state and especially around Puget Sound are just these hotbeds for archaeology. And some of you might wonder, okay, why? Why, why is there so much archaeology here? Well, um, I have a picture like this, like I took this one, I took up on Ross Lake. Um, you know, I was on a hiking trip and I'm, and I'm, we're looking at the lake and we're looking at how big the lake is and how far it is to walk around it. And there is an obvious solution. There is a shortcut getting from one end of the lake to the other. And that is by boat. <laughs> um, in the Northwest, if you are in an area that has lots of water, getting around by boat is by far the easiest way to get around. Um, the Northwest has lovely forests, but if you've ever tried to walk through one of our lovely forests when there isn't a trail, um, they're not so lovely anymore. <laughs> um, so um, this is why these archaeological sites are so concentrated around water, because everybody in the history of living in this state, both Native Americans and um, the groups that came after, um, the best way to get around was by water. And so naturally you'd move all your goods and supplies and everything by water while you unload your boat, you wouldn't want to carry them very far. So that means a lot of these occupation areas, which turn into archeological sites over time are going to be concentrated along the shoreline. So this is a great map. And I forgot to say at the very beginning that Whitney MG, who was a great employee here at the DAP, who recently moved on to a great job at Thurston County, um, created some maps for me for my talk, and I really, really appreciate it. I think she's on the talk today. Thank you, Whitney. Um, this is one of the maps she put together using um, our wizard database. She's a great with GIS. Um, and so this is a predictive model map. And so the DAP has a predictive model, which basically models the most likely places to find archeological sites in the state. We looked at a lot of environmental factors, geological factors, things like that. And you can see from this map that the shorelines are turning up red and those are the highest risk areas for archeology. span um, I also, on the right side, there's a close up of the southbound area. So you can get a better look at um, places like Tacoma, which are all red um, on the shoreline. Um, and that red kind of goes up the hills for a while before it finally turns to other colors. Blue are the lower risk areas. We still find sites in pretty much every part of the state, but they're much further apart and there's less of them in other parts of the state. So these shorelines are really important. Um, the water really drove um, all movement until modern times in this area. Um, these pictures here, um, the picture on the left is of the steamer, the Olympian, um, actually docked in Tacoma around 1885. Tacoma looked a little bit different in 1885. Um, Great little photo. Um, Tacoma was one of the hubs for the Mosquito Fleet. Um, the, um, I'm guessing any of you who are interested in history of the area probably have heard of the Mosquito Fleet. For those of you who haven't, it was a, a group of 
small passenger ferries that went all over Puget Sound. And this map on the right is um, a map of the route around 1908. And you can see the biggest hub is in Seattle on the right there, but Tacoma down below has a lot of boats coming in and out of it. Um, the areas to the west where these boats are going, most of those areas, the boats were the only way you could get there up until the 30s or 40s. Um, there were really no roads over there. So again, all of any um, archaeological sites left by these early historic people living out there um, would be close to these shorelines. Um, the same can be said for even earlier times um, when the Native Americans were the only people here. Obviously, I don't have photos from um, that time period, <laughs> um, but these are some uh, photographs from right at the, during the contact period of Native American um, boats. Um, and on the left, that, that one's in Salmon Bay in around 1905, and that's in Seattle, kind of near the Ballard Lock, if you guys are familiar with that area. And you can see there's the, his canoe is anchored out in the water. And then there's the house is very close to the shoreline there. Um, and then on the right is one of these great old photos of downtown Seattle back in the day um, where the tribal members would come in in their boats and they would come, pull them up on the beaches and then walk upland to go trade in Seattle. So this boat transportation has been really key throughout all the history here. I mean, even today we have the ferries, um, which are really important, but um, now we have highways, but in the past there just were not any. Um, so what kind of archeological sites are we gonna see? Well, from the historic coastal archeological sites, um, on the left, um, there's a picture of the Dickman Mill in Tacoma, and then the, the, the head saw on the left. Um, so that was, um, one of the artifacts that's left from that Dickman Mill site. Um, on the top, it's just a picture of Whidbey Island to show um, the kind of way early homestead sites were set up. Um, you would have the farmland and you would have the houses, but they'd still all be pretty close to the shoreline because you'd have to move all your goods um, by water into those locations. Um, on the far right, upper right, is actually a picture of a shipwreck we actually have lots of shipwrecks on our GIS map on Wizard. It isn't just on land, it's also in water. Um, and you get all sorts of things, including airplanes and train cars, and even parts of the fi original 520 floating bridge are recorded as archeological sites on our database. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's part of it, thank. Um, <laughs> And then um, below that, there's a picture of just a, a brick wall foundation and some artifacts that you could find from historic sites. Pre-contact pre archeological sites, there's lots of um, different sites you can find um, for Native American remains also. Um, I just used a new term, sorry, pre-contact. Um, we tend to use that now in archeology span instead of the term prehistory. Um, because by saying prehistory implies that Native Americans didn't have history, and they definitely did, and they had very strong oral history traditions. So we tend to use pre-contact, so that's what you'll hear me use today. Um, so on the left here is a wooden fish weir, or the remains of a wooden fish weir, so that would have been much taller, obviously. This is all that remains of it, and that um, as tides go out, the fish would get trapped behind them. So we sometimes find these these pre-contact fish weirs. There is a canoe in the middle that someone found in the mud on the shoreline during a project. Pretty amazing. Um, there's a piece of basketry in the lower left-hand corner. We sometimes find basketry preserved, especially in the water. It can sometimes survive. Um, the bottom picture is a picture of a, a hearth, um, so basically a fire pit. The weird rectangle cut in the middle is actually where an archaeologist took a sample out of the middle. Um, they don't usually look like that, um, but just the rock surface. And then on the right um, is a shell midden, and that I'm going to talk about a little bit more just because they're such an important type of site. So a shell midden, I've typed it out there for you because people often ask me, why are you talking about mittens? What are these shell mittens? I'm like, no, no, they're mittens. <laughs> um, and the story goes among archeologists that midden is a Danish word. Um, I've had some Danish people say yes, and some Danish people look at me like I'm crazy. Um, but basically it means um, 
a garbage or a kitchen garbage pile. Um, and basically that's what these are. This is where Native Americans would put all of their food scraps, all of, if they clean, swept out their longhouses, they would dump all the trash over here. So it's basically their kind of trash slash compost pile. Um, the woman pictured here is Julie Stein, who is actually uh, the current director of the Burke Museum. You may have seen her before. Um, she's done a lot of work with Shellman's in the Pacific Northwest and was one of my professors back in the day at, at the University of Washington. Um, and she's actually measuring um, how thick the Shellman is at this particular location in the San Juan Islands. All right, so what do we find in these Shellman? Why do we care about them so much? Well, they are amazing time capsules. They record everything people ate um, at this location. So obviously they eat a lot of shellfish um, and that's why there's so many shells in them. Um, but we also find animal bones, hopefully not an adorable little Bambi like the one pictured here, hopefully <laughs> adult animals. Um, and then also salmon, which we see roasting in one of those pictures and camas um, bulbs was one of the really important vegetable crops, um, kind of the equivalent of a potato, but with a little more protein in it. Um, so we find all these food remains in the shell middens. And what's really important about shell middens is um, any of you who garden probably know that the soil here is really acidic. Um, it's just naturally acidic. And acid soil, when water, rainwater percolates through it, tends to disintegrate things like bone and wood and all those kinds of artifacts we'd like to find. So most archaeological sites in the Pacific Northwest, you might find stone tools, but you're not going to find a lot else. Well, shells are basic. And so when rainwater percolates through these shells, um, they disintegrate a little bit and they actually neutralize the pH of that rainwater as it's running through the site. And so they preserve bone and wood and all sorts of different artifact classes really well. Um, so that's why they're really um, great for archeological work. Um, so these are some of the artifacts we routinely find in these sites. Um, on the left is a stone pestle. Um, on the top, those are actually net sinkers. So they would chip off the ends of these rocks and then tie ropes on them. And then you can put those on the bottom of your net when you're fishing. On the right are some bone harpoon points. And again, that's a, a class of tool that you just don't find unless you're in a shell bin generally. Um, on the bottom, some dart points. Um, arrowheads, spear points, those kinds of things. And then in the middle, another really nice piece of basketry, um, which sometimes preserve in these shell mittens. Okay, so I've talked about historic sites, pre-contact sites, and what's really interesting about sites on the shoreline is that we often get all these sites stacked on top of each other. Um, I put a term up there. I feel like every talk you need to learn a new word. So um, palimpsest um, is a term that archaeologists like to throw around um, to sound important. Um, and basically it means um, layers of things on top of each other that, um, and it originally comes from um, vellum. So that's before people had paper, they had animal skins and they were made into these vellum. Um, and you would write things on them that were really important but then the vellum was so costly to produce that you would scrub it off and you would write on it again and again. But over time, you'd kind of see the ghosts of the things that came before under the writing. A little bit of all the writing would show through. And so that's kind of this concept of the blimpsest is that you have all these layers and they're on top of each other um, through time. And so here I've drawn a little cartoon. Sorry about the cartoon, but I couldn't find a good picture that showed this. So I just threw it together. Um, but this is kind of a typical scenario here on the coast. Um, you know, you might be on your property and say, I have this old historic dock. It's going to fall down. I need to replace it. And I will say to you, there could be archaeology under there. Um, so right under that abandoned historic dock is the remains of an even older historic boathouse. And out in the water, you're going to see some broken off pilings that were associated with that boathouse. And then under that, you're gonna find a contact period shellman. So this is a, a shellman that um, came together, Native Americans were living there, but they were trading with Europeans at the time. 
So it might have a mix of European tools, some plates, but it's also going to have traditional Native American objects in it. And then under that, you might have a landslide. Those are real common on the coast. So just some dirt, basically. Um, and then under that, you might have a pre-contact shell. You might have an older occupation by a related Native American group that's, that was before Europeans got here. So you have all these layers on layers on layers on layers. Um, and it's pretty common to have what we call a multi-component site that you have historic stuff, you have pre-contact stuff, and you can kind of dig through those layers and see everything. Um, and these are just common on the shorelines because there's on a shoreline, there's a restricted amount of land. So people had to live in the same place over and over. Okay, so finally we're getting to this. Okay, so how does sea level change threaten these sites? Um, so there's a number of different factors that are occurring with climate change. Um, and I'm gonna look at and just kind of talk about three of the big ones um, for sites. Um, first of all, coastal inundation, just water rising and moving inland. Um, increased storm activity um, is a big one. I think that's been in the news a lot and people have been experiencing firsthand. Um, and also landslides due to increased water through rainwater um, soaking the land. So those are three big ones um, that we can look at. Okay, I apologize for all the words on this slide. I just wanted to make sure they were there so I told you everything, but you don't have to read it if you don't want, I'll tell you. Um, so this is a map from um, the Tacoma Climate Change Resilience Study from 2016. Um, if you haven't seen it before, it is on the City of Tacoma website. There's an executive summary, which is short and easy to get through. And then there's the full document, which is very long, um, if you're really interested. Um, and here I just took a screenshot, screenshot, screenshot of um, the coastal inundation map where they're showing, okay, based on projections for sea level rise, what parts of Tacoma could be getting flooded at high tide events. Um, and so on this map, the dark blue areas are areas that are already um, kind of at sea level and occasionally get inundated with king tides today or have the possibility of being inundated. But the light blue areas are all areas that today are dry and by 2050 are projected to be getting flooding events. And that's actually a large area in this lower part of Tacoma. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a little worrisome for people. Um, and at the same time, you're likely gonna be experiencing um, increased rainfall. So there could also be in the areas that aren't blue could be experiencing more landslides. Too. So you could be losing some edges there too. Um, so what would the impacts of archaeology be for these flooding events? Well, so I just, on Wizard, I drew a box around this area of, of Tacoma and looked to see what we know is there already. So we have 46 archaeological sites reported in this area, both historic and pre-contact. There's 10 historical period um, cemeteries in the area. Those include both formal cemeteries that might you might recognize as a cemetery, as well as unmarked graves that have been discovered over the years. Um, there's 19,000 historic properties, so buildings and structures that are that are in this possible flooding area, um, and then 93 register properties, either state, local, or national register. So that's a lot of cultural resources um, in an area that could be experiencing a lot of um, coastal inundation. So. Um, one thing to look at also to when you're trying to think about where are these archaeological sites going to be is to look at where is the original shoreline in Tacoma. And so that's what this is actually a picture of. I went on the Washington State Coastal Atlas map, which is run by the Department of Ecology. It's another great map you can get onto. It's freely available to the public. And there's lots of different layers you can turn on. And one of, them, one of the layers you can turn on is historic shoreline. Um, now, don't worry about the colors that are showing up right now, um, but basically everywhere there is a color drawn is kind of a meandering drawing of what that original shoreline looks like. So you can see that a lot of um, Tacoma is actually sticking out into the water, which was actually an intertidal area in the past. And so the city has moved out into the water. So some of these areas that are going to be flooded um, were kind of became land fairly recently. 
Um, and so there may not be a lot of archaeology to be found there. Um, but these more, these areas that are along the original shoreline are very high risk for archaeology. And let me, this is a great map. I don't know how clear it's going to be. Um, but I wanted to at least tell you about these. So these are, um, this is a map made in 1877 of Commencement Bay. And these were part of the US Coast Survey that was done in the mid to late 1800s, basically to map the US coastline for the first time. And um, these maps are actually all um, for Puget Sound are all available on the Puget Sound River History Project um, website and they've digitized and you can just click on the map and see these different maps. And they're amazing. You can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and there's more and more detail. On this map, I was just curious, what did original, you know, in 1877, what did Tacoma look like? Well, that circle in the upper left of the map that was Tacoma, <laughs> that little area there. <laughs> um, there wasn't a lot of Tacoma. That little dock sticking out is where that picture I showed you of the boat um, docked in Tacoma was located. Um, and then there's this area to the south called New Tacoma, um, where um, it looks more industrial down there. There's some railroad tracks and docks and things like that. So that was probably more of a mill town area. Um, and then if you go further south, you can see the river delta for the Puyallup River. And the areas I've circled down there, those, those little rectangles that you can see are actually the, the original fields for the original homesteaders. And if you zoom in on these maps, you can see the little rectangles that are the original houses of the original homesteaders. So you can really get a feel for where um, people were living during the historic period from these maps. Um, you can also get a good feel for where pre-contact sites might be because um, Native Americans would have been living along these old shorelines, not the modern shorelines. So this gives us a good map of where to look for those kinds of sites. All right, so obviously landslides could have a major impact on archaeological sites. Um, the picture in the upper left here is a rather dramatic landslide from Whidbey Island a couple years ago. Um, there's a poor little house down there in the lower right corner that somehow survived <laughs> the landslide and they are very lucky. Um, these are massive events. Um, you can lose an entire archaeological site in a day in a landslide like this. You can also have an archaeological site buried by a landslide and actually be preserved by a landslide. So landslides can be terrible for archaeology and they can also protect archaeology. So it's um, a little bit of each when it comes to landslides. Storm activity, on the other hand, is really a destructive force. Um, as you can see on this picture on the right, I hope no one is in those houses at the time of the storm. <laughs> it looks really scary. Um, the wave action just beats against the shoreline and can really destroy a site in a very short amount of time. So storm activity is a real problem for, for archaeological sites um, because the result is erosion, massive erosion of sites. Um, this picture in the middle is, um, it's kind of a sad picture. It's what's left of an archaeological site. And this massive um, big leaf maple tree had basically with its roots been hanging on to this archaeological site as it grew. And the waves have just undercut it. And all those shells that are on the beach are what's left of that shell midden that's fallen down onto the beach. And so almost none of the site was left. There was a little pocket of shell midden. We actually collected it um, when we took this picture um, to take to the museum just so we could have something left from this site. So erosion can be a massive problem. Um, this is another picture from the San Juan Islands where um, erosion is a big problem up there right now. So there, it's easy to get good photos. Um, so this, again, all the shell you're seeing in this picture is from a shell midden that's just getting blasted out by um, when there's king tides in this area, they come up and hit that back beach and just rip out these sites. So it definitely is a problem and we definitely first see there will be an increased loss in sites. Um, so we have um, been doing some work trying to kind of quantify what we're going to lose. And um, this is another great map that Whitney MG made for us based on our data um, where she was looking at uh, just inundation, we just started, let's look at inundation, let's look at sea level rise and see 
um, how many sites are going to be impacted? Well, the first really interesting thing was based on our data, um, 339 coastal sites in Washington are already under king tide level. So when we're having high tides, there's 340 sites that are already being inundated on a pretty regular basis by these king tides. Um, those are the little X's on the map, which are kind of hard to see. We have lots of different categories. I did a little zoom in on the left, again, on the south sound, so you can just get a feel for where the sites are scattered around. Um, oh, I forgot to say the red and white stripes on the outer coast there. That's an area where we just didn't have um, the right kind of data um, to do this calculation. So that area, um, so these numbers that I'm giving you are excluding that part of Washington. So the numbers are higher. Um, we just didn't have the right data right now. Um, and then in that little box and all the colored dots, um, she just kept raising the sea level, one foot, another foot, another foot. And those numbers are all additive. So you add one foot of sea level rise, it's 42 more sites. You add another foot, it's 52 more sites. And so just as you go, you get more and more and more and more sites. So it's definitely a problem. Um, and so models like this one are just kind of the first step to identifying which sites we need to be worried about. So based off of this data, we can start making maps of which sites we need to worry about in the future. But then the question is, what are we going to do, right? <laughs> so um, how do we protect these sites? Well, one thing that archaeologists do, which we already do a lot of the time, is something called salvage archaeology. We do this a lot for construction projects in the state, um, and it's a lot of the work um, that I um, consult about at the agency is determining what to do when a construction project is going to intersect with an archaeological site. Um, and we often routinely send in teams um, of contract archaeologists who go in and dig ahead of the backhoes, basically, collecting artifacts, collecting data, and so we can at least rescue the information from these archaeological sites. So we can't, you know, dig the site in a big block and take it home with us, but we can at least rescue some of the information. Um, it, there's always a debate in archaeology about how much you should be digging, because um, digging, even if you're an archaeologist, it's destructive. You're destroying the site as you're investigating the site. And so for most sites, we try to only dig sample areas of the site, and we try to leave portions intact so that in 100 years, when an archaeologist who has new techniques and new questions gets to a site, there's something left for them to dig. Um, because, you know, we're always advancing, we're scientists, um, we're always learning new techniques. However, with climate change, we wouldn't really have a choice. Um, so one option is we could go into these sites that we know are eroding very quickly and just try to salvage all the information we can. Um, another option, you could build barriers. Um, so the picture on the left is a kind of horrible looking bulkhead <laughs> that I one time investigated. Um, and sometimes with these bulkheads, if you dig a hole behind them, if you dig down through the fill and everything, you'll find an archaeological site preserved behind this bulkhead. Um, early historic bulkheads, especially the, the wooden kind of soldier pile bulkheads you often see, um, were often built, they would, there would be the slope of the shoreline and they would just build it um, in front of that and then they just put a bunch of dirt behind it. So it would actually cap and fill and protect the archeological site. Um, however, we now know that bulkheads are really bad for the environment. So there's kind of a push to try to get rid of bulkheads. Um, so this picture on the right is actually a project where they were removing an old historic bulkhead and then returning the shoreline to a more gradual slope, which is much better for the intertidal area and promotes um, much happier living conditions for young fish. Um, but in the front part of that picture, there's some grass and there's a little red flag. And that little red flag says there's an archaeological site on the other side of that little red flag. And so we, we worked with this landowner and they actually left the old bulkhead directly in front of the archaeological site and so that it wouldn't get washed away or impacted by the backhoe, but then did their restoration projects on the rest of the property. So it was a bit of a compromise and that site is still protected by that bulkhead. Um, the problem with bulkheads is when they fail, they often fail spectacularly. And 
um, when they go down, the entire site can just get blown out um, in a storm, in one storm event. So it's not necessarily a long-term solution. It may be a good short-term solution until we figure things out. Um, another thing to consider are bigger barriers. <laughs> so if you've ever looked at, at the work they do in the Netherlands, where at least half their country is below sea level, um, they have gone big when it comes to um, climate change and trying to stop the ocean from inundating their land. Um, these are two examples of barriers. The one on the right is actually a movable barrier. They can open and close it. I cannot imagine how many billions of dollars this thing costs, um, but that's a great barrier for you know allowing boats to come and go, stopping those big storm waves. You can close it during high tide events and protect the land behind it. So in a situation like this, the archeological sites that are behind it probably would be protected. Um, the archeological sites outside the barrier might be impacted worse with the waves hitting that barrier and then glancing off. It could actually cause more destruction outside the barrier. And then also you would have to consider what sites might be impacted where you're building the barrier. Um, there's a lot of moving parts on this thing. Now this one was probably built completely on um, man-made land um, because so much of the Netherlands is man-made land. So they wouldn't have had to deal with archeology span with this one unless they hit a shipwreck. Um, but the one on the left is more of a traditional barrier where it goes up and down um, and can allow water in and out tidally. And so that kind of barrier um, you know, could potentially also impact archeology span while they were constructing it. But maybe it would save things. And I think a lot of cities in the next, you know, these seem big and ridiculous to us right now, um, but I can imagine in 50 or 100 years, these might be the kind of decisions that cities are gonna have to make. I can envision something this big, you know, across Commencement Bay. Um, it's a nice, long, narrow, you could put a little barrier across it. Um, so these are the kind of um, decisions that are gonna be coming up in the next 50 years, I think. Um, and so definitely some things to think about. All right, so conclusions. Um, I would like to point out, I've never used so many question marks in a talk before. <laughs> um, and that's because there are just so many questions right now. Um, I just couldn't stop with the question marks. So um, we're still kind of in the learning phases. We are when it comes to climate change, and, and that means we also are when it comes to how we're gonna re react when it comes to cultural resources. Um, I talked today about archeology, span but I also just wanted to point out that buildings are also, historic buildings are also um, being lost um, to climate change. This is actually um, the Enchanted Valley Chalet in the Olympic National Park. And this one's actually being impacted by the melting glaciers up there. Um, they're having these big washout events and it's undercutting this historic lodge. And they've actually, the Park Service has already moved it once <laughs> and they're considering moving it again. Um, so these are big expensive issues when you have whole buildings you're trying to save as well. Um, so, I mean, erosion is a natural process. Um, and it's something sites have always been eroding through time, archeological sites. But what we're seeing with climate change is an acceleration of this process. It's getting faster, more dramatic, um, bigger. We just have less time to deal with it. Um, and so you might ask, okay, you, you brought up all these issues today, but what can we do about this? <laughs> so as citizens who are watching, um, you know, one thing you can do is always ask questions when planning is going on, when there's city planning projects, when you're considering putting your giant barriers in or your small barriers, you know, ask the question of your city planners and county planners, you know, are you taking into account cultural resources? What are the impacts going to be? How can we mitigate that? Um, you can also um, there are some organizations like the Archaeological Conservancy who are actively looking to buy sites and try to preserve them. Um, and um, places like the National Park Service Fund, um, you know, they're they're working to try to save these sites because they feel responsible for them. So there's there may be some opportunities for citizens there to kind of take part in these processes. 
Um, but right now we are still just trying to figure it out. So um, creativity and any good ideas that citizens have are always appreciated. <laughs> so um, sorry to leave you without a, a secure conclusion, um, but that's just the state of affairs right now. But hopefully I've at least given you some things to think about and maybe worry a little bit about, hopefully not too much. <laughs> Everyone will sleep tonight. Um, before I close, I just did want to acknowledge again Whitney MD, who, who put together a lot of these maps here today. Um, the city of Tacoma, thank you for having this Heritage Cafe series. That's great. Um, I just put again the Department of Ecology up there so that um, people can remember that's a good place to go look for maps. And, um, and then again, acknowledge the Puyallup tribe, even though I'm not on their land right now, I did talk about their land quite a bit in this talk. All right, so that's the end of my talk, but I am happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Stephanie. That was um, so in depth and and very uh, one amazing. Thank you. Um, and two, I think that um, I, I do want to say, uh, though you know, climate change um, and shore level rises are certainly a concern in Washington. I think most of us are more freaked out about a possible. Uh, you know the the big earthquakes than necessarily how um how we'll be affected by things not as big or not as i guess catastrophic but i think it's it puts more emphasis on why we should prepare early for these um potential uh issues and and um dangers to our uh our resources so I do not see any questions um, in the chat so far. Anyone is welcome to ask anything. Um, Stephanie, I hope you're not, uh, no, okay, cool. You for a second were um, paused I, on my screen. Uh-oh, <laughs> I didn't um, run away, I promise. <laughs> so uh, one thing that I wanted to um, share that I, uh, a little, um, joke that I thought as we were watching this is when you were um, talking about the um, oh my goodness now I'm um, not going to remember the word um, there's a very fancy word um, a palimpsest yes <laughs> yeah. palimpsest I gotta uh, make there sure one. I add that <laughs> to my to my vocabulary um, but about how uh, I was going to say that um, one historical person's trash might be um, an archaeologist, uh, an archaeologist's treasure uh, in a lot of regards, <laughs> going through trash piles. But that's where we find, you know, all of the, the valuable um, information that we need about what people are doing and what their lives were like. Exactly. And actually, you know, I didn't talk about it in this talk, but the best historic archaeological site you can find is actually a privy is someone's um, outhouse remains. Um, I love them. They are amazing little places because people used to put things in there that they didn't want their neighbors to know about. Because historically, you would have your little trash pile outside your house and any neighbor visiting could walk by and see what you've been eating or what pottery you'd broken, what crockery you'd broken. But if you were a closet alcoholic or you were taking some sort of weird, you know, treatment for a disease or something, you would throw those bottles in your privy because you didn't want anybody to know about it. So when we excavate these privy deposits, they can be a little smelly when they get wet, um, even hundreds of years later, but they are usually full of really interesting things that nobody wanted to talk about back in the day. Um, so you can get really personal stories out of a privy. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That but is definitely a little gross. <laughs> for sure. But yeah, no, absolutely finding out what people were eating, who was sick, what was going on. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love the the disposing of evidence seems um very similar to, you know, <laughs> when children throw away something they don't want mom to see and they stuff yep. it into uh a candy wrap and it overflows and then mom's like, oh, so that's where all of the, you know, cookies are whatever it was that you were trying to hide when exactly um, yes so yeah Very cool those are fun <laughs> nice I also loved the point that you had um about how and this is something that I think is is um 
comes up a lot in Washington state history, but um, in is an important part of history in general um, and between archeology span and history is how much our um, shorelines are not, um, are entirely like man-made and are not the historic shorelines that um, they would have been prior to white settlement. Um, and how amazing that as a, one as a feature of like this entire area um, throughout the Puget Sound is almost entirely, you know, all of our ports are entirely man-made. Um, I think that that also lends a lot of, uh, a lot to how we can find those important histories through things that aren't even real. You know, we think that we can get something and it's, it's actually totally, in you know, fabricated. Place. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I sometimes, you know, recommend um, an archaeological survey for an area that's pretty far inland because that's where the actual shoreline was. And often the, the landowners are like, what do you mean? We're not on the shoreline. And I'm like, well, you were <laughs> a long time ago. Um, if, you, if you've ever driven around Renton, you know, south of Lake Washington, there's a whole river, the Black River is the under there. And um, it's just not there anymore. And so one of the things, whenever I review projects that are happening there is, I have to turn on the old maps and overlay them to figure out where the river channel was because we have lots of sites that have been found along that river channel, although buried pretty deeply because of all the fill that's gone on. Um, but yeah, it really surprises people that there was a giant river here. <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> there used to be. Um, lots of rivers have been moved too. Anytime you see a straight section of river, it's probably been man-made. Um, they probably, because most rivers go like this, and people like them to go like this, because it, shipping is more efficient. So if you see a straight river section, it's probably man-made. Interesting. I'll, I'm going to, I am totally going to look at rivers so much more in depth um, from now <laughs> on. Um, and then, yeah, I think it's also coming, my, my background is in history, and I think that, um, it, it shows, and one of the reasons that I'm glad that we were able to do this uh, talk in this presentation is because there's so much about history that overlaps absolutely with um, geology, geography, the historical um, archaeology, you know, everything yeah. it, that history is not just, oh, what people write about in books, but that when you're actually applying those concepts, you have to put yourself back into the world that doesn't exist is completely new now and you know you can't really get that unless you go back and look through maps or uh, you know all of these uh databases i'm going to make sure that we um include a lot of um the links that you had uh mentioned to all of these varying um databases through uh the ecology uh, department of ecology or um was the other one you mentioned river the river, the river project. history project yeah with all those old maps they're great yeah <laughs> i look at them for fun sometimes <laughs> get get access to those because i'm sure that that helps um you know a lot of the the context to yeah. what we're yeah. what we're trying to discover yep and it, yeah it just it's always amazing to look back at at how the landscape has changed because in some places it's almost the same and some people places it is so different now <laughs> you wouldn't even recognize it so yeah right it's fun. well I love um I love that you that you know uh with this uh entire um issue of climate change and um and how we are going to prepare for the future um I guess my my question was going to be we know, um, and your answer at the end, which was, uh, we don't really, we're trying <laughs> to figure it out, but it seems like we're at a stage where it's mostly data and mostly trying to get the, the full context of showing exactly what's going to happen and then seeing where the potential, using that data to find out where potential places, um, uh, danger zones are. So that then we can prepare that. Is that sort of where the yeah, you know, that's, that's 
pretty much where we are um, throughout the U.S. is just kind of this data gathering stage um, and trying to identify where the big problems are. Um, there are some bigger projects that have started in places like Ireland where they actually, um, they kind of have a public archaeology project where they just go and walk the entire shoreline and they're just surveying in these teams of just members of the public looking for archaeological sites that are eroding out just to get a like 100% survey of the shoreline. Um, it's a pretty big dramatic project they're trying. Um, and some other countries are, are starting to try to start up, okay, how can we um, basically work with the public? You know, we just don't have enough archeologists even to tackle, you know, all the potential sites that could get impacted in a short period of time. You know, how can we kind of use the public and their interest to help in these projects? Um, and so that's, um, you know, I, I hear in archeological circles, there's definitely, especially grad students are talking a lot about um, you know, using the public to do work and do science. There's, you know, they grew up in a time of citizen science, which us older archaeologists did not. And so it's just an automatic fit for younger archaeologists to think about the potential of citizen science. So I think that's really where a lot of the solutions are going to come from is, is getting big groups of people together, um, more than just the few archaeologists that are available to really tackle some of these bigger problems. So... Hopefully, hopefully we'll get that together in in short order so that we can actually start taking action um, instead of just trying to, yeah, work through the data, which is what we're trying to do right now. Yeah, it seems like there's somewhat of a, a race against the clock, um, you know, because there is a somewhat of a timeline to yeah. the end to this where we're like, yeah, things are going to, that's when things get bad. Let's make sure we figure it out before then. Well, perfect. Um, seeing as we have reached our time at seven o'clock, I don't want to um, keep everyone uh, who probably has, you know, wonderful Thursday night plans. But I just wanted to thank you again, Stephanie, for this fantastic conversation um, and presentation on our cultural resources and the way that they are being endangered. Um, I hope that everyone enjoyed the conversation and if you have any further questions or would like uh, access to those links, I am going to try to get those up in the Facebook event that this uh, was created under. So if anyone has anything more on that, and then um, of course, please contact uh, either me or Stephanie if you have any further questions about, um, she can answer archeology span questions, but I'm sure <laughs> I could answer some um, history questions for you. Yes, and our um, all the DAP staff, our contact information is on that website I mentioned at dap.wadicov, and it, there's just a meet the staff button. And if you click on that, you can find all of the staff who have all the different specialties we have here at the DAP. Love that. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, with that, I'm going to say good evening to everyone and thank you again for joining us. Um, our next Heritage Cafe will be uh, in November and will be the third Thursday, which is not um, the week of Thanksgiving. It is the week prior. So uh, keep that in your calendars. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.